Hi, my name's Casey and I am from Dublin, Ireland, and I'm going to be covering some of the lesser known cases that have happened in Ireland over the years. And um, the first one I'm going to start with is one I actually only came across myself last week when looking for different cases. And I was surprised that I'd never heard of it before and um, because it's not that long ago. And it seems like it's it's just been forgotten about. And so it's the one I'm going to start with. So this is the unsolved murder of Charles Self. On the morning of January 21st, 1982, Bertie Trier awoke at an Ansley Mews on Brighton Road in Monkstown, Dublin. This was not where he was from, he was actually from Wicklow, but when the weather was bad, he stayed with Vincent Hanley and Charles Self in their home that they shared in Ansley Mews. Hanley was actually in London at the time, so Bertie stayed in his room. At 8.50am, he went to go downstairs and this is when he found Charlie at the bottom of the stairs, lying in a pool of blood, dead. Charles Charlie Self was born in England in 1949, but he was raised by an aunt in Scotland after his mother tragically died when he was young. Um, it is believed that his father remarried, as friends have mentioned that when they, his parents have come over, they've met both of them. He originally worked for the BBC and um, when Alpho O'Reilly persuaded him to come work for RTE, which is the national broadcaster in Ireland. So he was the main set designer. He worked on The Late Late Show and different um, specials like the Twink Christmas special. He was described as being witty, bubbly and a person that you wanted to be around by his friend Bill Maher. Um, as I said already, that he lived with Vincent Hanley, a very well-known uh, disc jockey at the time, and they both um, flat shared or house shared in Ansley Mews, which was a house just off Brighton Road down a little lane. It was connected to another um, house, St Anne's Mews, by a courtyard that they shared. Charlie was a well-known figure in the Dublin gay scene and at the time in 1982 homosexuality was still illegal in Ireland. So we're going to start the day before which was Wednesday the 20th. Um, Charlie decided to head in on his lunch break to meet uh, a friend for a drink. His car had actually broken down so he left it in the RTE um, car park. It was a really bitter day. The snow had been coming on and off for the last few days. So we got the bus in and he met his friend Bill Maher for a lunchtime drink in the Bailey on Duke Street. At 2.45 he finished his last drink and decided to head back into work. He was going to meet his boss. Um, as I said before he was a set designer for the Late Late Show and he had done the Twink Christmas special just beforehand and it had been a huge success so he was in line for a pay rise which he was obviously delighted about. After work he did head home but then he decided to head back into town and um, so while waiting for a bus a sympathetic motorist actually uh, gave him a lift and dropped him into O'Connell Street. At 8.30pm he headed back to the Bailey um, where he had a few drinks and then he moved on to the South William pub at 9 o'clock. He spent about an hour and a half there and at half ten he headed on to Bartley Dunn's where he was drinking with about five friends. Bartley Dunn's was also known as a last port of call for a man who may want some male company. After an hour at Bartley Dunn's, he left at half eleven and went to the Hot Pot Cafe where he ordered food, ate his food at the counter while chatting to other customers. He left here at five past midnight and headed over to Burg Quay where the public toilets were and he was seen speaking to two men. Um, these toilets were also known as a notorious pickup spot. At 12.20 a.m. a taxi picked up Charlie and an unidentified male who was described as being in his 20s, smartly dressed in a two-piece suit and having long fair hair. The taxi, the taxi man described them as being amorous in the taxi and dropped them off at Charlie's house at 12.40 a.m. At 2 a.m. Bertie Bertie said that he heard conversation downstairs. At a roughly half two, he said a man came into the room, said, sorry, wrong room, and left. At 4 a.m., Mary Liddell, who um, was in the other house that joined the courtyard, 
said that she heard um, what sounded like the bench being dragged across the courtyard and when she looked out she saw a man climbing over the wall and then we have at 8.50 a.m. Bertie discovers Charlie's body. Um, he ran down, climbed over the body, tried to call the emergency services from the living room and the, he couldn't get a dial tone so he had to run across the courtyard to Mary's um, house and the emergency services were then called at 8.59. Charlie was found slumped, um, slightly blocking the front door. His uh, black sweatshirt had been pulled up to under his arms. Um, he had been stabbed 14 times in the chest and his neck had been slashed three times. Six of the stab wounds to his chest uh, were so vicious that they were through and throughs, meaning they went through his chest and completely out his back. The knife was believed to be from a knife set that Charlie had purchased previously. Um, so it was described as a weapon of opportunity. There was also a cord from Vincent Hanley's dressing gown tied tightly around his neck and the other part of the cord was actually tied to a chair in the living room. And the stereo in the living room was still on. There was records strewn about the place. I have a quote from the detective sergeant at the time, Alan Bailey. He said, the scene that was presented to Gardy was that of a serious assault having taken place downstairs, initially in the kitchen area, then in the living room, and finally in the narrow hallway at the foot of the stairs. There was also furniture in the living room uh, placed over pools of blood, so the Gardy definitely thought that some of the scene had been staged. Um, they also believe that it was made to look like the suspect left through the kitchen window. But the kitchen window was quite small, it was actually only like two feet wide and it opened inwards. Um, and also there was a window uh, flower box on the windowsill outside that had been placed down onto the ground. And they obviously said that if someone had tried to get through the window, they would have knocked it over or like the flowers or the dirt would have been spilled but it was nothing was spilled it was carefully placed on the ground so they believe that that was a, a staging just another quote about um the scene and about the, the crime itself the big thing was with charles self was the absolute overkill it would indicate somebody who wasn't just killing them to rob them the wounds that penetrated the body were no mean achievement the kitchen knife bailey calls a weapon of opportunity Obviously, because Charlie's body was um, partially in front of the front door, they did believe that it was impossible to leave that way. And that is what made them believe that he could have went through the kitchen window. Although Charlie's friend Bill Maher said that he didn't see why it wasn't possible to go through the front door. Um, I mean, I suppose you could have went through the front door and Charlie then, then fell when he became weaker, fell onto the, the door, I suppose. So firstly, just about um, Bertie Trier, I guess. Um, Bertie Trier was in his 60s, so the, they kind of reckon that he was hard of hearing and this is why he didn't hear the commotion um, downstairs. Which is kind of a bit confusing because he said that he heard conversation downstairs at 2am. So if you could hear conversation that was just happening or put maybe music or maybe whatever was happening, I don't know why he wouldn't hear um, screams or um, uh, things being knocked about and stuff. I don't I don't know why you wouldn't hear them if you just heard conversations. The dressing gown that had the cord um, around Charlie's neck was Vincent Hanley's and it was in the bathroom next door in between Charlie and Vincent's room. So again, Bertie didn't hear the, the suspect take it from there. Bertie did draw a picture of the man who came into his room, if you remember, came in and said, sorry, wrong room. Um, he drew a sketch for the guards and the man had dark curly hair and he also mentioned something about a West Brit accent. Um, and if you remember, the man who came home with Charlie in the taxi had um, long fair hair. So it's believed that there was actually another man in the, um, in the house at the time of the, of the attack. Maybe the man with fair hair had gone by this point. I don't know. They have asked for the man with fair hair to come forward and he has never come forward, which we will give reasons for that in, in a minute. Gardy had questioned two um, rent boys 
that were in the Hot Pot Cafe around the same time as Charlie um, the night before. There was Kitty and Ruby. Kitty was a 19 year old from Bluebell who denied ever being in the Hot Pot, Ca Hot Pot Cafe. Um, witnesses couldn't place him there and the taxi man was sure that he was not the, the male that accompanied Charlie in the taxi. Ruby was 19 as well and was from Kulak and had a motive for that night and his fingerprints did not match any from the crime scene. So one of the main issues that came up with the investigation was that homosexuality was illegal in 1982 in Ireland um, and the Gardaí were known to be very homophobic. They went out investigating and interrogating um, gay men in Dublin, some who had no ties to the, to the crime or to Charlie in any way. They would show up at their homes, at their places of work and insist that they give statements, that they let them take their fingerprints, that they take photographs. A lot of these men, because of the situation in Ireland, weren't out to their families or to their jobs, obviously for, for many repercussions. And um, unfortunately, it turned out that there were there were men who were, who were essentially forced to come out to their family and to uh, their colleagues because of the way the Gardaí were treating them. I just have another quote here. Um, I'll put all the sources and links down below. McKinney says Gardaí showed no sensitivity and no sense of confiden confidentiality about people's lives. A bunch of my friends were outed through that process. I know for a fact that a number of people left the country because of that experience. So this can obviously be why um, the man with fair hair never came forward because maybe he wasn't out. Maybe he didn't want the repercussions of what was happening to other gay men in Dublin at the time. The same as they believe a lot of witnesses from the different the different pubs, from from the toilets on Burr Quay that were known to be a, a, a pickup spot. They weren't going to come forward like the two men that um charlie was seen talking to have never come forward and again they believe that this could be because of fear of persecution sketch that bertie made of the man um was shown to bill maher by the guards shortly after and he didn't he didn't recognize the man but when it came up again the guardy told him they didn't have a sketch that there that there was no sketch um, and this would go on for decades where the Gardaí insisted that they did not have a sketch and it was only in 2017 that they said yeah we do have a sketch but to this day the sketch has never been released so obviously then the public the public can't help the public can't give tips so I don't understand why it was never released unfortunately Charlie's murder was quickly forgotten by the media um, and this was because it was overshadowed by another crime that would be described as uh, Gubu, G-U-B-U, which was um, grotesque, unbelievable, bizarre and unprecedented. Um, again, some of you might know the next name that I'm going to say, some of you might not know it. I knew of it because we were told it as like, uh, like kind of like they made it into like a ghost story kind of myth. But um, Malcolm MacArthur in 1982 bludgeoned a nurse when she was sunbathing in the Phoenix Park. And three days later in County Offaly, he shot a farmer on his own land. There was a huge manhunt for Malcolm MacArthur and when he was finally arrested, he was staying at the uh, Attorney General's house. So obviously it was sensationalised, it was, it was such a drama that it just took away from any other crimes that were happening at the time, unfortunately. MacArthur was also known in the gay scene and apparently known to Charlie. Um, he was also said to have been a regular drinker in Bar Bartley Duns, but told an interview to a tabloid newspaper that he stopped around the time that Charlie was murdered. I don't know if he means to imply as in he was fearful that something like that could happen to him or I don't know, it just seems a bit, a bit dodgy. Malcolm MacArthur was released in 2012 and Bill Maher says that a reporter told him that a Garda source said, I know that's a lot, that Charlie's killer was in prison at the time. Um, so some have led that to think that could it be uh, Malcolm MacArthur who also killed Charlie. So I'm going to put a picture up of Malcolm MacArthur. Obviously we don't have the sketch that Bertie uh, drew. But he described the man as having dark curly hair. I'm going to now put up a picture of Malcolm MacArthur. 
So as you can see, Malcolm MacArthur had dark curly hair and I don't think it's out of the realms of possibilities for this to be a crime that he done. Again, a spontaneous crime. He he didn't know the nurse, he didn't know the farmer. These were just um, crazy, bizarre, random attacks and murders. So it's not to say that he didn't attack a bit closer to home, someone he knew. However, police do say that they interviewed Malcolm MacArthur and they do not consider him a suspect. Unfortunately, this case hit a dead end because of so many witnesses that would not come forward, particularly the mystery blonde who has never come forward and could hold the key. Was he there when the man with the dark curly hair arrived? Maybe they were all drinking together, maybe they were all having fun and something happened, maybe the maybe the man with the dark curly hair started to attack Charlie and the blonde man took his, his leap and ran. I saw a few a few kind of theories online about uh, Bertie's place in it and I think one was trying to imply that how could he sleep through that and he must know more or was he part of it especially if you, you couldn't get out there was no way to get out because the front door was blocked and the kitchen window was too small to get out of. Another theory said that maybe he Maybe he did hear it and out of fear he didn't go down because he didn't want to also be attacked um, and has kept quiet because of the fear of of the shame of, of not helping his friend. Again, these are just theories. Um, the only thing about the house which confused me was, again, I was picturing like a typical Irish house where you go in and usually your living room or sitting room is the first room and then the kitchen is in at the back. And that's what I thought. And then from a picture that I've shared of um, Charlie, you can see him. It's a picture of him out in the mew in the courtyard of the mews. And the picture from the newspaper article that I took it from describe it as a uh, scene from his kitchen window, which would imply then that the, the kitchen is beside the courtyard. But if you remember, Bertie couldn't get a dial tone from the living room and had to run across the courtyard. So... There must have been another way out. There has to have been a back door for him to get out because he was hardly in his 60s climbing through a two foot window. So I think maybe they just, I don't know, described it wrong in the newspaper articles from the time. Again, as I say, there's there's not a lot of actual um, newspaper articles out there on this. There was a few around kind of the anniversary and there was a crime call episode that I took some information from. They're all very vague when it comes to the, the 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 back door if there is a back door but I think that there had to have been a back door and the killers made it look like they went through the kitchen window but again then why wouldn't it just be assumed that they went through the back door I don't know it's so confusing um Gardy in the crime call episode said that um they are appealing for the witnesses to come forward some have obviously I'd say died since now since then but they are hoping that if anyone is still alive and has information to please come forward. Um, they know that the Ireland back then was a very different Ireland to now. And they can assure people that they will be treated with sensitivity and confidentiality if they do come forward and help. And they do believe that without the mystery blonde coming forward, the case will never be solved. If you happen to have any information on it, no matter how insignificant you think it might be, you can call Dunleary Garda Station on 01-666-5000. So, yeah, I don't know if you found that story as interesting as I did because there was so many different connections. Um, and I just find it bizarre that to do with, like, RTE is such a huge thing in Ireland. And for it not to be known maybe maybe everybody out there is like it is known Casey um but then I don't know where I've been living uh for the last how many years so um so I'm hoping to bring more cases like this to YouTube that are lesser known that are not really getting the exposure that they should um newer cases older cases and I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you'll come watch the next one thank you bye